Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, Peter. I'm so pleased that exam's over. Me too, Crystal. I'm exhausted. Well, you can rest now. We're on holidays for three glorious weeks. That is a nice thought. Unfortunately, though, I'm broke. And if I'm going to have enough money to get through next semester, I'll have to get a job over the holidays. Yes, I've been thinking the same thing myself. As much as I'd like to go home to see my family, I think I'll have to get a job as well. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm going to go to the student employment office. Do you want to come with me? Sure, if you don't mind. Where is it? It's up here, in Y Block. Oh boy, we're a long way away from there. We've just come out of N Block. Here we are here. Yes, N Block. Well, we can turn right and follow Circular Drive around, but that's the long way. What's the building opposite us? That's the International Centre. I learnt English there before starting my Bachelor of Business. Oh, right. I see. It says I block. I guess I stands for International. Well, let's cross Circular Drive and walk up to the right. No, there's lots of trees and gardens there. We'd better go to the left of the building. You can't get through otherwise. OK. We'll head past D block go between B and C blocks, and then across the sports fields to Y block. OK, but I'm really hungry. How about going to the student canteen before we get to Y block? It's just on the other side of A block, near the main entrance. Good idea. I didn't have breakfast this morning. I'm starving. Let's go. Answer questions 6 to 10. Good morning. Can I help you? Good morning. Yes. We'd both like to find some vacation work. Right. You will need to register, but before you do that, you'll need to be interviewed by one of our consultants. Oh. Would you like to make an appointment to have an interview? Yes, please. Yes, as soon as possible. Let me see. Today's Thursday the 11th. Our consultants are here tomorrow, but they are going on a staff in-service from next Monday to Wednesday. So, it's either Friday, that's tomorrow, or next Thursday. Crystal, is 9.30 all right with you? Yes, that suits me. Actually, I'm going to the dentist tomorrow. Let me check the time. Hang on, the dentist is at 9, so could we make it at 2? No problem. OK. That's for 2 o'clock, then. What's your surname? Pastel. P-A-S-T-E-L. Peter's my first name. Thanks. And yours? My surname's Lou, L-U, and my first name's Crystal. Right. A contact phone number, please. My mobile is 0412-987-35. Thank you. And I'll need your student number as well, so I can access your files. Uh, mine is B, for business, 72346. And mine is B, for business as well, I69011. That is the end of section 1. Now turn to section 2 of your listening question booklet. Look at questions 11 to 20. Good evening. Um, I've been asked to tell you all about the Brisbane Festival, which is being held here in Brisbane from September the 8th to October the 6th. You are all, of course, welcome to come along to the various activities that we have planned while you're visiting our city. We're happy to announce that we have some free tickets, which I'll hand out later. The Brisbane Festival is held every year in a number of venues around Brisbane, not only to show off our own local talent, 
but also to celebrate the incredible talent that we have in the Australian and the South East Asian region. It's a great time for us to catch up with our interstate and international friends, and we're thrilled that this year we have a record number of performances from Southeast Asian participants. We have seen an increased amount of interest from European and American artists in recent years, and we welcome them as well. Our goal is to bring people together through art by making art accessible to everyone. The Brisbane Festival aims to promote cultural understanding and interaction. Right, well, as you experience today, we have a wonderful climate here in Brisbane. Our average temperature is about 24 degrees Celsius, and we have something like 290 sunny days a year. Naturally, we want to take advantage of this, so we've scheduled performances in public places such as South Bank Parklands and the City Gardens, as well as the more traditional indoor venues, the Performing Arts Centre, Brisbane Convention Centre, the Brisbane Powerhouse, and some of our university campuses. I'll hand out a copy of the program shortly, but I'd like to tell you about some of the highlights of the program. The first event that I'll be seeing is the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra at the Performing Arts Centre tomorrow night. That's September 8. It starts at 8pm, and because there is one performance only, you should get there well before 8pm, say 7.30 at the latest. And then for something completely different, Monkey, which is a play, is showing at the Powerhouse at 6.30 on the following night. We also have plenty of music on the itinerary. For those of you who like to hear arias, world-renowned soprano Sumi Jo is performing with the Queensland Orchestra on September the 11th. She will be starting at 8pm. And talking about music, Festival Club is going to be held every evening from Wednesdays to Saturdays at the City Gardens. For those of you interested in visual arts, from September 13, no, I'm sorry, September 14, the Art Gallery will be displaying works in the Asia-Pacific Triennial. If you like drama, you'll have to see Slava's Snow Show the next day at the Performing Arts Centre. It is a Russian production which has been wowing audiences from Moscow to London. It starts at 6. Again, don't be late because I'm sure that will be very popular and the Performing Arts Centre has limited seating. Barbara Fordham will be performing a series of concerts at the City Football Club from September 20. Concerts start at 8, as I said, at the City Football Club. We also have a Poetry and Writers Festival happening in Brisbane, if you're into that. The Poetry Festival starts on September the 22nd, and the Writers Festival will be on from October 4 to October 6. And if you don't go to anything else, you simply must go to the Opera Under the Stars at City Gardens. This will be the grand finale on October 6. OK, that's it for me. I really hope that you take the time to join in whenever you can with the Brisbane Festival celebrations. That is the end of Section 2. Now turn to Section 3 of your listening question booklet. First, look at questions 21 to 30. Nancy and Jenny are presenting the first of our profiles on Asia today. You looked at Singapore and Malaysia, didn't you? Yes, and we found lots of similarities between the two countries. Did you follow the outline that I gave you? Yes, we did. Um, first of all, the total land area of Singapore is 630 square kilometres, whilst Malaysia's was 329,758 square kilometres. Obviously, Malaysia is a much larger nation with a bigger population, almost 24 million. It is bigger than Australia's population, in fact. We have 19,700,000. Um, Singapore has just over 3 million. Did you look at their population mix? The population of both Malaysia and Singapore are multiracial. 
They each have a mixture of Malays, Chinese, Indians, and other ethnic groups as well. The breakdown of the population is different, though. In Malaysia, the Malays, or Bumiputras as they're called, outnumber the Chinese and the Indians. They make up about 65% of the population. In Singapore, three quarters of the population is Chinese, with only a few hundred thousand Malays and Indians. Australia has had a fairly stable relationship with Singapore over the years. Can you briefly talk about that? Um, yes. Singapore and Australia have always maintained a friendly and warm relationship. As Jen said, many students come to Australia to study here, and often they stay here to work. Singapore and Australia signed an expanded trade accord in February, which covers all sorts of subjects from education through to customs procedures at the airports. It's accepted that this accord will really strengthen ties between the two countries. So trade between Singapore and Australia is continuing to grow. But we're not one of Singapore's top three trading partners. They're the US, Japan and Malaysia. Yes, and interestingly, but not surprisingly, I guess, Malaysia's top three trading partners are the US, Japan and Singapore. Yes, Singapore and Malaysia are neighbours, so you would expect that. What did you discover about the relationship between Malaysia and Australia? Well, um, it hasn't been as stable as Singapore and Australia's friendship. Malaysians and Australians get along well on a personal level. There have been an increasing number of tourists travelling between the two countries. Malaysia now doesn't want to blindly follow Western ideas, which is fair enough. Yes. This is something that we'll talk about later in the semester. Australia's international relations in the region. There do seem to be misunderstandings and disagreements between Malaysia and Australia, but diplomats say that these are exaggerated by the media. Yes, we all know the power that the media has. Was there anything else? Well, um, yes. What I found was that Singaporeans are generally regarded as well-educated, well-travelled, knowledgeable. The Singaporean government is spending a lot of money on education and technology. I see. And how did this differ in Malaysia? Well, the Malaysians are very enterprising people. They're well-educated and highly skilled too. Malaysians were much more Asian in their way of thinking, although they seem to mix Eastern and Western traditions easily. That is the end of Section 3. Now turn to Section 4 of your listening question booklet and answer questions 31 to 40. You will all have a vague understanding of what being a vegetarian is all about. Vegetarianism has been practiced for thousands of years. The simplest definition is someone who doesn't eat meat, of course. But does abstaining from eating meat include seafood and chicken? Within true vegetarianism, that is where a vegetarian is someone who doesn't eat any meat at all, right through to those strict vegans who will only eat vegetables, fruit, beans or pulses, that is, food that has been grown. For our purposes today, we'll be talking about vegetarians as those people who don't eat any form of meat at all, red meat, fish or poultry, but do use dairy products and eggs. Lacto-vegetarians and vegans are not in the majority anyway. With that definition in mind, let's review the myriad of reasons given for adopting a vegetarian diet. These include all sorts of preposterous theories that claim all humans should be vegetarian simply because it's natural, or that humans are naturally vegetarian because biologically we resemble plant eaters. In the real world, vegetarians, generally speaking, accept that humans are omnivores. They are capable of eating both plant and meat foods. Statistics show that the majority of vegetarians have adopted a vegetarian diet because of their religious beliefs, as in the case of Hindus and Buddhists, for example, or because of health-related concerns. That is, they see vegetarianism as a healthier alternative. 
Look, that's not to say there aren't other reasons. Some people just don't like the taste of meat and others simply can't afford to buy it. A significant number of vegetarians are animal liberationists who are against the killing of animals for human consumption. These vegetarians have taken the step of refusing to eat meat and in doing so, show that they don't condone those killings. They see the whole industry as barbaric. In the past, at least in my social circle, such a cause was seen as noble and many of us held vegetarians in high regard. They lived up to their beliefs. In more recent times, as we see the disastrous impact of introduced hooved animals on lands and the amount of resources used to feed stock at the expense of using arable land for crops, their noble cause has been ecologically justified as well. Land resources, and arable lands in particular, are scarce and becoming scarcer. Perhaps it is wrong to allocate these resources to raising those animals which provide us with a food source that we can live out. But is this the case? Can we live without meat in our diet? And is living a vegetarian lifestyle indeed more healthy as advocates would have us believe? Vegetarians claim that a well-balanced vegetarian diet will supply all the essential nutrients we need to be healthy. In Western societies, as late as 20 or 30 years ago, there were many myths about vegetarianism. Those switching to vegetarianism would be warned about serious vitamin deficiencies. Statistically though, the vegetarians are supported in their claim that vegetarians are healthier than meat eaters. The incidence of heart disease and cancer, for example, are significantly lower in non-meat eaters. In fact, it's claimed that the risks from certain cancers are reduced by up to 40% in a vegetarian diet. And let's face it, in modern Western society, with our concerns regarding obesity, you don't see too many overweight vegetarians, do you? Vegetarians consume less fat and protein than we do, and the fat that they do consume is in the main unsaturated, which is what has been recently labelled good fat. On the other hand, animal fats tend to be saturated, and an increased intake of saturated fats can lead to high cholesterol. Respiratory problems too seem less common in vegetarians, but this is also the case with meat eaters who include a lot of fruit and vegetables in their diet. The UK Vegetarian Society's website quotes medical research has shown that on average, a lifelong vegetarian visits hospital 22% less than a meat eater. The fact that the number of practicing vegetarians has almost doubled in the last 15 years speaks volumes about the way our concerns for healthy living have changed. The reasons given for this increase have been, according to a recent survey, 94% due to the perceived health benefits associated with a vegetarian lifestyle. <clears throat> Doctors and nutritionists and responsible groups like the Vegetarian Society are rightly concerned that those adopting the vegetarian diet do so in an informed way. There are health benefits to be gained by turning vegetarian, but there are also guidelines that need to be followed. Vitamin B12, for instance, and recommended amounts of iron are not easily found in a vegetarian diet, and yet they are vital for healthy living. So. Where can such vitamin and mineral replacements be found in the vegetarian diet? Well, for the average vegetarian, good sources of iron are spinach, prune juice or dried fruit. Vegetarians are advised to eat these foods with fruit juices which will increase the amount of iron absorbed. B12, on the other hand, is not as readily available because it is only found, to all intents and purposes, in meat, fish and dairy products. This vitamin is one which vegetarians find difficult to replace. However, as I said, low amounts of B12 can be found in dairy products as well as soy products or seaweed. For the stricter lacto-vegetarian and vegan, B12 can be obtained from foods that have been fortified with the vitamin. Vegetable margarines, some soy products and breakfast cereals are the most common sources. The key to a healthy vegetarian diet is the same as any other diet. 
eat a wide variety of foods including grains, fruit and vegetables, beans, pulses and nuts. Vitamins and minerals must be included in the vegetarian diet, just as they have to be included in a non-vegetarian diet. You can argue all you like about vegetarians being healthier, but I'd suggest that you consider a well-balanced diet first and foremost. Whether or not you include meat is up to you. A good vegetarian diet closely matches the dietary recommendations for a healthy meat-eating diet. There's an excellent website which I suggest you look at if you want further information on vegetarianism. It's www.vegsoc.org www.vegsoc.org That is the end of section 4 and the end of the listening test. You now have half a minute to check your answers.